Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to introduce Krylov subspace methods, which is an interesting mathematical framework that is well suited for dealing with sparse matrices. We can use Krylov methods to solve linear systems and also find eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In this video, we're going to look at the Arnoldi iteration and the Lansosch iteration, which are two well-known examples within the Krylov methods family. We now give an overview of the role of Krylov subspace methods in scientific computing. And suppose we have a matrix A and a vector B, then we can define a Krylov sequence by repeatedly multiplying B by A. So we can end up with the set of vectors b, a b, a squared b, a cubed b, and so on. We can define corresponding Krylov subspaces as the spaces spanned by successive groups of these vectors. So km of a b is defined as the span of b, a b, a squared b up to a m minus 1 b. And Krylov subspaces are the basis for iterative methods for eigenvalue problems, and they can also be used to solve linear systems. And there's an important advantage in the Krylov method construction in that we don't deal directly with our matrix A, but rather with matrix vector products involving A. So that would be very helpful if we're dealing with a matrix A that is large and sparse, because in that case, matrix vector multiplications can be evaluated relatively cheaply. We can even use Krylov methods in the case when our matrix A might not be available to us directly, but could be given to us by some black box function that evaluates the operation of multiplication, but doesn't actually give us a way to see the elements of this matrix itself. We can still construct a Krylov sequence in this case. We can also see that a Krylov sequence is closely related to a power iteration, and therefore it's not surprising that it's going to be useful for solving eigenproblems. The first Krylov method that we'll look at is the Arnoldi iteration. And to begin, we'll define a matrix as being in Hessenberg form in the following way. We'll say that A is called upper Hessenberg if its entries Aij are equal to zero for all i greater than j plus one. So this is equivalent to an upper triangular matrix, but allowing for terms one below the diagonal. We'll say that A is called lower Hessenberg if its entries Aij equals zero for all j greater than i plus one. And this is equivalent to a lower triangular matrix, but allowing for entries one above the diagonal. The Arnoldi iteration is a Krylov subspace iterative method that reduces A to upper Hessenberg form. And as we'll see, we can use this simpler form to approximate some of the eigenvalues of A. So let's suppose now that A is a complex n by n matrix, and we want to compute a equal to q h q star, where h is upper Hessenberg and q is unitary. So specifically then, q q star will be equal to the identity. But in this case, we're going to assume here that n is huge, and therefore we don't want to compute the full factorization. Instead, we want to consider some much smaller set, m, of columns of the factorization. So we'll look here at finding aq equal qh. So therefore on the left hand side we only need the matrix qm which is a n by m complex matrix. So we can write here this qm as having columns q1, q2 up to qm. On the right hand side, we only need the first m columns of H. And more specifically, due to the upper Hessenberg structure, we only need H tilde m, which is the m plus one by m 
upper left section of H. So H tilde M is shown here. We'll have our upper Hessenberg uh, matrix that is truncated after M plus one rows and M columns. And we see here that H tilde of M only interacts with the first M plus one columns of Q. And therefore we have then that A Q M is equal to Q M plus one H tilde M. If we look at this diagrammatically, we have that A applied to the first M columns of Q is equal to the first M plus one columns of Q applied to H tilde of M. And if we look at the nth column, we can see that can be written as A times QM is equal to H1MQ1 plus H2MQ2 up to HMMQM plus HM plus 1MQM plus 1. And equivalently, we can write that QM plus 1 is equal to A times QM minus H1MQ1 minus H2MQ2 up to HMMQM divided by HM plus 1M. And we can see here that the Arnold iteration is just the Gram-Schmidt method that constructs the HIJ and also the orthonormal vectors QJ. The Arnoldi iteration is therefore very similar to the Gram-Schmidt method that we used to construct the QR factorization. And in the algorithm, we first choose B arbitrarily, and we then define Q1 to be the normalized version of B. Then for M equal one, two, three, and so on, we do the following. We first compute V is equal to A times QM, and then we orthogonalize V with respect to all of the previous Q vectors. So for J equal one to M, we compute HJM is equal to QJ star V, and then we update V as V equal V minus HJM QJ. After doing this, we compute HM plus one M as equal to the norm of V, and we then compute QM plus one as equal to V divided by that norm to get a orthonormal vector. So this is akin to the modified Gram-Schmidt method because the updated vector V is used in line five of the algorithm versus the raw vector AQM. In addition, we only need to evaluate AQM and perform some vector operations in each iteration. The Arnold iteration is useful because the QJ form orthonormal bases of the successive Krylov spaces. So we see that KM of AB is equal to the span of BAB, A squared B, up to AM minus one B, and that will be equal to the span of Q1, Q2, up to QM. And we expect that KM of AB will provide us with good information about the dominant eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. And we can note that this looks similar to the QR algorithm, but the QR algorithm was based on the QR factorization of the matrix where we have columns given by A to the K E1, A to the K E2, up to A to the K E N. So, once we've done the Arnold iteration, how do we actually find the eigenvalues? And what we can define here is HM to be QM star AQM, and that will be the M by M matrix obtained by removing the last row from H tilde M. And at each step M, we can compute the eigenvalues of the Hessenberg matrix HM, for example, using the QR algorithm, and that will provide us with estimates for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, specifically the first M eigenvalues and eigenvectors of our matrix. And we refer to these as the Ritz values and Ritz vectors respectively. And just as with the power method, 
we expect that the Ritz values will typically converge to the extreme eigenvalues of the spectrum. We now examine why the eigenvalues of HM approximate the extreme eigenvalues of A. And let PM monic be the set of monic polynomials of degree M. So specifically, this is all polynomials of degree M where the leading coefficient is equal to 1. So there's a theorem that tells us that the characteristic polynomial of HM is the unique solution of the approximation problem of finding the element P in PM monic such that the Euclidean norm of P of A applied to B is minimized. And we're not going to look at the proof here, but the details can be found in the Trefethen and Bau textbook. This theorem implies that the Ritz values, specifically the eigenvalues of HM, are the roots of the optimal polynomial P star that minimizes the Euclidean norm of P of A applied to B. Now let's consider what P star should look like in order to minimize this Euclidean norm of P of A applied to B. And we can illustrate the important ideas with a simple case where we suppose that A only has M distinct eigenvalues, much less than the total rank N of the matrix. And let's suppose now that lambda J are those eigenvalues and VJ are a set of corresponding eigenvectors. And let's suppose that our vector B now can be expressed as a linear combination of those eigenvectors. So we have then that B is equal to the sum from J01 to M of alpha J of VJ. So let P now be a polynomial in PM monic, and we can write then that P of X is equal to C0 plus C1X plus C2X squared up to X to the M, where C0, C1 up to CM minus 1 are the coefficients. If we apply this polynomial to the matrix A and then multiply it against the vector B, then we have P of AB is equal to C0I plus C1A plus C2A squared up to A to the M applied to B. And we can now substitute in our expansion for B in terms of the eigenvectors. So we have the sum from J1 to M of alpha J, C0I plus C1A plus C2A squared up to A to the M VJ. And that will be equal to the sum from J1 to M of alpha J, C0 plus C1 lambda J plus C2 lambda J squared up to lambda J to the M applied to VJ. And that will be equal to the sum from J1 to M of alpha J times P of lambda J applied to VJ. So we see then that the polynomial P star in PM monic that has roots at lambda 1 to lambda n will minimize the Euclidean norm of P of A B, because in this case, P of A B will actually have a zero Euclidean norm. So in this simple case then, the Arnoldi method will find the P star after M iterations. And in this case, the Ritz values after M iterations are exactly equal to the M distinct eigenvalues of A. So suppose now that there are more than M distinct eigenvalues, as is generally the case in practice. It's intuitive that in order to minimize the Euclidean norm of P of AB, P star should have roots that are close to the dominant eigenvalues of A. Also, we expect that the Ritz values will converge more rapidly for extreme eigenvalues than, that are well separated than for the rest of the spectrum. And we'll see a concrete example of this for a symmetric matrix A shortly. We'll now look at the Lanzos iteration, which is another Krylov method and a special case of the Arnoldi iteration when A is Hermitian. And we'll see that this leads to some significant computational savings. For simplicity, we'll focus on the case where A is symmetric with real entries, and therefore it will have real eigenvalues. So HM, which is defined as QM transpose AQM, will also be symmetric, and therefore the Ritz values, the eigenvalue estimates, will be real. 
We can also show that HM will be tridiagonal in this case. And let's look at the IJ entry of HM. So we have then HIJ will be QI transpose AQJ. And we recall first that Q1 to QJ is an orthonormal basis for KJ AB. So therefore we have that AQJ is in kj plus 1 ab and that is equal to the span of q1 to qj plus 1 and hence hij is equal to qi transpose a qj and that will be equal to 0 when i is greater than j plus 1 since we know that qi is perpendicular to the span of the q1 to qj plus 1 for i greater than j plus 1. In addition, since hm is symmetric, we know that hij is equal to hji, which is equal to qj transpose a qi, which implies then that hij is equal to 0 for j greater than i plus 1, by the same reasoning above. So since hm is tridiagonal, we can write it as tm, where we have terms alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha m on the diagonal, and then terms beta 1, beta 2, beta m minus 1 on the sub and super diagonals. So a consequence of the tridiagonality is that the Lanzos iteration is much cheaper than the Arnoldi iteration to implement. If we recall the Arnoldi iteration, when we were computing qm plus 1, we had to orthogonalize it with respect to all of the previous q1 to qm. Here, because of the special tridiagonal structure, we only need to consider orthogonalization with respect to qm minus 1 and qm. And we have a three-term recurrence relation at step m. We have that a times qm is equal to beta m minus 1 qm minus 1 plus alpha m qm plus beta m q m plus 1. And this follows from the same discussion as the Arnoldi case, but here we've replaced h tilde m with our tridiagonal matrix t tilde m. As before, we can rearrange this to give that q m plus 1 is equal to a times q m minus beta m minus 1 q m minus 1 minus alpha m q m divided by beta m. And that leads us to the Lanzos iteration. We first set beta 0 equal to 0 and q0 equal to 0. These are actually outside of our usual matrix. The betas are numbered from 1. But we make these definitions just to handle a missing term in the very first iteration through the loop. So we choose b arbitrarily, and we then set q1 to be the normalized version of b, and we then consider m equal 1, 2, and so on. We first calculate v is equal to a times qm. We then evaluate alpha m as qm transpose v. We then compute v is equal to v minus beta m minus 1, qm minus 1, minus alpha m qm. And when m equals 1, because of those definitions, we will have that the beta term vanishes here. We then compute beta m is equal to the Euclidean norm of v. And then we set qm plus 1 is equal to v divided by beta m. And we'll now look at a Python example of the Lanzos iteration in action. Let's now look at the program lansosh.py that demonstrates the Lansosh algorithm for finding the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix. And we're going to test the algorithm on a matrix that has a set of eigenvalues shown in the bottom left diagram. We'll make use of n eigenvalues that are linearly spaced between 0 and 2. And then we'll also add in two isolated eigenvalues at 2.5 and 3. And we know that the Lanzos algorithm is particularly good at finding eigenvalues that are isolated in the spectrum, and so this is a useful test case. 
So in the code, we first define diag vector to be the set of eigenvalues. So we have the linearly spaced set, and then we also add in the isolated values at 2.5 and 3. And we then compute a diagonal matrix from the diag vector. So those eigenvalues will just be in the diagonal entries of this matrix. We'll then initialize the Q matrix that we'll use in the Lansach algorithm, as well as the alpha and beta parameters that are used. And we'll then define a random initial vector B that's used to generate the sequence of Krylov subspaces. And then the first column in our matrix Q will just be given by a normalized copy of B. We'll then perform the Lansosh iteration and we'll perform the steps where we first compute the product A times times Q and we then compute uh, alpha at this stage and we then adjust V using alpha and beta and we then compute the, the new beta. And at the end, we get a new column of Q by normalizing that vector V. Once we have this, then we can compute the associated Hessenberg matrix by calculating Q transpose times A times Q, and we'll then compute the eigenvalues of this Hessenberg matrix. And here, we're just going to make use of NumPy's eig routine. However, we could use a custom algorithm, such as some of the approaches considered earlier in this unit. We'll then save the characteristic polynomial of the Hessenberg matrix using the numpy.poly routine. And we'll sample this polynomial over the range from minus 0.5 to 3.5 using the polyval function. We'll also save the roots of the polynomial into a file called roots. And we'll first add the true eigenvalues of our matrix that are stored within diag vector. And we'll then put in a few new lines and store the eigenvalues of the Hessenberg matrix that would correspond to the roots of the characteristic polynomial. So in this case here, we have 12 eigenvalues and we're going to perform four iterations of the Lansosh algorithm. And so in this case, then, we're only going to get a small subset of Ritz values that approximate the eigenvalues of the, the full matrix. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And we'll now look at GNU plot to look at the output of the program. So first I'm going to plot the roots of the characteristic polynomial of the original matrix, which could correspond to the eigenvalues. And I'm now going to add the characteristic polynomial of the Hessenberg matrix here that's stored in this file called poly. And so we see in this case that this characteristic polynomial has one root that very closely aligns with the eigenvalue at three. And this is as we would expect, since we expect it to catch these extreme values uh, very well. And then this polynomial also has four roots that are distributed among the range from zero to two. And currently, we see that the value of 2.5 is actually far away from a root of the characteristic polynomial. So we could also add the specific roots of the characteristic polynomial uh, that are also stored in the roots file. 
and these will correspond to the RITS values. So let's now look at how we can get better accuracy for this test case. So let's first increase the iterations to 5 and we'll run the program again. And in this case now, we see that two of the RITS values get both the isolated eigenvalues of 2.5 and 3 uh, quite accurately. And we still have four RITS values that are distributed over the range from 0 to 2. So let's now increase the number of iterations further. And if we increase this to 11, then we should capture the complete spectrum of the eigenvalues of our test matrix. And so in this case then, we can now see that we capture all of the eigenvalues of our matrix accurately. So suppose now that we increase the n the number of eigenvalues in that spread from 0 to 2 and we'll increase this to 20 and we'll keep 11 iterations of the Lansosh algorithm so now again we're not going to be able to recover the precise eigen spectrum but we should be able to do fairly well. And so we see that we capture those two isolated eigenvalues well in this case. And then we have some spread of RITS values over this range from 0 to 2. So finally, let's look at what happens if we increase the iterations of the Lansosh algorithm to 21. And so in this case, then we should be able to again capture the full eigen spectrum. And indeed, we can in this case. So again, we have complete recovery of the eigen spectrum.